Welcome to MACNA 2020 Phoenix Rising. I'm Kevin Erickson. I have the amazing pleasure today to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Ben Titus. Ben recently received a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship from the European Union to conduct a full genome sequencing on 10 species of sea anemone that hosts clownfish. He was working with Dr. Nicholas Solomon at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland to sequence and assemble host anemone genomes to test fundamental evolutionary questions regarding mutualism and to better understand the genomic basis for the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis. Here to talk to us about more than just Nemo, new insights into clownfish sea anemone symbiosis is Dr. Ben Titus all the way from Switzerland. Welcome today, Ben. Hello, bonjour <laughs> from the French bonjour. speaking part of Switzerland on the shores of Lake Geneva. Yes, so uh, yeah, well, thank you um, for having me. I need to advance this slide, here we go. Okay, we're up and running. Well, welcome to MACNA 2020. Um, I am very excited to uh, be the first speaker. Uh, I hope everybody is uh, safe and healthy and as happy as humanly possible given uh, the global pandemic situation. Um, you know, if you are like me, um, I have not been in the water and I don't have a tank. So I have not seen a live animal for quite some time. Uh, so I thought I'd start off with like a nice relaxing video that I took in the Maldives a couple of years ago. Um, and so, yeah, I am, like Kevin said, I'm uh, excited to talk to you today about uh, new insights into the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis. And as you are probably well aware, I refer to the clownfish symbiosis really as the sort of gateway drug of the aquarium trade. Um, my guess is that this is probably one of, if not the first animal or animals that you purchased when you uh, set up your first reef tank. Maybe this was the symbiosis that got you interested in the aquarium trade hobby um, in the first place. Um, and so there's, um, a lot to discuss about this symbiosis. It's very familiar, and, um, and, and maybe uh, you're sick of it. Maybe this was the first thing you got, and maybe you are so advanced now, you, you've done everything you want to do with the clownfish symbiosis, you're sick of it, um, and you think you know everything there is to know about it. So, uh, you know, hopefully today we can sort of reinvigorate some of that interest that you may have lost if you are sick of it. If you still love it like me, uh, great, maybe you'll learn some, some new things. Um, so really, uh, as the sort of poster child for the aquarium trade, um, you know, I would be remiss on, of course, not to bring up Finding Nemo. Um, and really, so, so the trade um, as a whole um, is valued at hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Um, and of those animals um, that are so valuable, um, probably nothing is more common and recognizable than uh, the clownfish and their host sea anemone um partially thank you uh disney and finding nemo for popularizing that um to the degree that they have and so you might know of course that the fish live inside the anemone without getting stung um you might even know a few of the different species of clownfish um and you might think that that familiarity means like we know all there is to know about uh the symbiosis and so um, that really kind of masks a lot of the intricacies um, that we don't know. And so today, what I, what I really want to talk to you about is uh, some of my research that I've done, some research that other people have done recently, um, surrounded, um, really framed by this question of like, how much do we really know about this iconic symbiosis, other than just simply um, what we learned from, from finding Nemo. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So I'm gonna frame this um, really through three questions. There, I could talk for hours about all the different aspects of the symbiosis, of course, but uh, I really think there are three main questions that um, I would like to kind of share with you today. And the first one is um, maybe deceptively simple. It is how many clownfish and sea anemone species are there and uh, how and where did they originate? Um, so that is a very basic question um, that is not as straightforward as it might seem. Uh, the next thing we'll talk today about is how does the symbiosis actually work? So I'm sure you know, of course, that the fish can live in the anemones without getting stung. Um, but what are some of these underlying mechanisms that have allowed the fish uh, to live essentially with immunity 
um, in, in an animal that eats other fish. And then finally, um, is there a hidden partner in the symbiosis? And um, is that partner um, conferring some additional mutualistic benefits to the fish and the host anemone? So these are really the three main questions that um, I'd like to dive into today and kind of share with you some, some research that's been done in these areas over the last couple of years and some research that I've conducted that hasn't even uh, been published yet. Um, so a little bit of a uh, quick background on me before we dive in. Uh, I am a marine and evolutionary biologist, and I use uh, a variety of different DNA sequencing techniques uh, to understand the evolution and ecology of sea anemones and their symbionts on coral reefs. Um, I also conduct quite a bit of field work, um, so I do work all over the world right now on the clownfish symbiosis. Of course, it's primarily in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Um, but previously, I've done uh, quite a lot of work in the Caribbean as well on sea anemones and their cleaner shrimp communities. And um, I did want to spend some time um, pointing out that I, I got my professional start um, working on the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis uh, when I was a master's student um, at Auburn University working with uh, Dr. Nanette Chadwick. And um, I wanted to put this slide up here um, because uh, sadly, uh, Nanette passed away this past March uh, very suddenly. And, um, you know, I got a chance to spend time uh, about three years working with her while I was a graduate student at Auburn. Um, she really sort of gave me my first professional opportunity in marine science. Um, I got to spend a month working with her in Jordan. Um, in, in the Red Sea, and then also quite a bit in the Caribbean as well. But um, Dr. Chadwick uh, spent um, over a decade um, in a lot as a professor in Israel, um, working in the Northern Red Sea. And she's one of the most important community and population ecologists um, that have worked on the clownfish symbiosis. So she spent a lot of time working on the endemic Red Sea anemone fish, Amphiprion bisynctus. Um, understanding uh, their behavior and reproductive patterns and patterns of host choice and host preference in the Northern Red Sea. She's published dozens of articles on the clownfish symbiosis and, um, and, and recently, maybe uh, most notably, uh, found some really interesting um, mutualistic benefits that had been unknown about the symbiosis. And that is that at night, uh, the clownfish, as they sort of hunker down in their anemones, um, are oxygenating their host. And so they're facilitating gas transfer. Um, that was a paper that came out a number of years ago now um, that was a really important insight um, to the symbiosis. And so I just wanted to um, mention Nanette and uh, kind of express my gratitude for the time I got to work with her um, and just really the contributions she's made uh, to this field specifically. So um, what do we know? about the clownfish symbiosis. So if you just jump in, what are the, what are the basics? What, where, where, where are we all at? So I think the first one, of course, is uh, these are found only on coral reefs of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Um, so it's a massive range. It's uh, about half the circumference of the globe. So all the way from the Northern Red Sea to Israel and, in Israel and Jordan, uh, completely through the Indian Ocean, um, and into the central Pacific Ocean, about as far east as um, French Polynesia, and as far west um, as, uh, as the eastern coast of Africa, almost all the way down um, to South Africa itself. So it's a very expansive geographic range, um, and it is not found in the Caribbean. So if you go to the Caribbean, you will not see any of these animals. Of course, we know that the, uh, the clownfish are gaining protection from predators um, by living in the anemone tentacles. We you know, oftentimes refer to, they are immune um, from the sting of, from the anemones. We'll talk about that um, and the misconceptions about that in a little bit. Um, but the anemone is a, is a refuge for the anemone fish, um, keeping them safe from groupers and, and moray eels and things like that. Um, and they also are, the fish are also incredibly aggressive. And so they are providing protection to the host itself. So these corallivorous butterfly fishes that cruise the reef and pick at anemone tentacles, those get chased away. Uh, sea turtles get chased away as well, if you can believe it. So I, even, even in the Red Sea, we saw some, some bisynctus anemone fish uh, 
pecking at the eyes of some passing sea turtles. Um, there's even a video out there of a, a fish biting the tail of a black debris shark in Morea. So these are highly aggressive territorial little damsel fish. And so um, they are also protecting um, their host anemones. And of course, uh, nutrients play a very important role in the uh, mutualism with <laughs> sea anemones and clownfish. So coral reefs are very nutrient poor ecosystems. That's why the water is so clear. And so the um, nitrogenous waste products from the fish that drop into the host anemones are important sources of nitrogen actually for the host anemones and um, can even act as fertilizer for the um, symbiotic algae that live in the tentacles of the sea anemones and, and the body. So it's uh, there's a multi-level symbiosis there. And, and like I mentioned from uh, Nanette's research, um, the, the fish are also oxygenating their anemone hosts at night and increasing gas transfer. So those are sort of the basics about the clownfish symbiosis. Um, and so to sort of dive in to um, kind of the main part of the talk, um, we will start with how many clownfish and sea anemone species there are and where did they originate? So we'll start first with some of the, the work on the clownfish. Right now, there are approximately 30 species, 30 described species of clownfish. And so clownfish are member, members of the damselfish family. And this is a, a clade or a group uh, of fish that live in obligate symbioses with sea anemones. So they are only found living with sea anemones on tropical coral reefs. Um, this, is a, this is an image from a recent paper. You can see um, sort of the, the variation in coloration um, and pattern and body shape and size of, of these 30, um, 30 clownfish species. Um, but um, just like anything else, as soon as um, scientists and researchers start sequencing the DNA of these 30 different species that are primarily described using the physical morphological characteristics, um, we begin to start to see that the picture um, is not quite as clear cut as, as maybe uh, the original taxonomy had, had described. And so I'm going to run through a couple of these um, familiar species um, that turn out to actually be more than, more than just one species. Um, but I did want to point out, because I forgot about this, um, the three main species that are in the trade um, primarily are these three in red circles here. This is Premnus biaculatus. This is the spine or maroon clownfish. Amphiprion ocellaris um, is probably the most common species in the trade. And then the true clownfish, which is Amphiprion percula. So those are the three main ones that you would probably see the most, you know, walking around the MACMA showroom or um, in an aquarium store, but um, uh, just three of 30, just a, a very small fraction of the diversity that actually exists out there. So I'm going to run down a few. Uh, the first one is Amphiprion clarki. This is uh, the Clark, uh, Clark's anemone fish. Uh, this, is, this is fairly common in the trade. Um, it's an aggressive species, but it's a host generalist, so it can live with all 10 of the anemone hosts. Um, and you can see here on this phylogeny, this evolutionary tree on the left, Amphiprion clarki is um, denoted by this orange triangle. And it has a very long branch um, that is in the middle of a lot of really short branches. And so that sort of um, is a sign there, there might be some hidden diversity. Uh, those long branches in these evolutionary trees might signify there's some hidden diversity within this group. And so um, actually Roland et al. So this is actually a piece of work that's, um, that came out of the research, research group that I just joined here in Switzerland. Um, they did some population level sampling of Amphiprion clarki and found that uh, within this group, there's probably at least two to three undescribed species of uh, Amphiprion clarki. And you can see where I've sort of denoted these red arrows. Um, these three different lineages have been split um, for about a million years. So they've been isolated from each other for quite some time. Um, and so Amphiprion clarki looks like it might be its own little species complex. Um, similarly, um, one of the common ones in the trade, the spine cheek or maroon clownfish. Um, this was work that was done by Litsios 
um, at all, also part of the Salomon group here in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, they did some, they did some uh, sampling as well of, of Premnus bioculatus from Malaysia and Bali and found that they were highly divergent, about two to two and a half million years divergent from each other. Um, so it looks like Premnus, um, the maroon clownfish might be two separate species as well. Uh, of course, Amphiprion percula, the true clownfish, is, a, is another interesting group here um, from the same paper. Um, this is really interesting, too, because if you can look closely at the tree, the Amphiprion percula from Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands um, are actually more closely related to the Amphiprion ocellaris from Bali than they are to the other Amphiprion percula from Papua New Guinea. Um, and so these are some species, this is a very interesting um, relationship that might actually be changing as we get some, some better data. But um, minimally, you're seeing two very long branches of these within the Amphiprion percula group um, that have been split for probably four million years, even though they live in very close proximity to each other. Um, so moving on, um, other complicated groups, um, Amphiprion chrysopterus. Um, this is not as common in the trade, but this is, uh, as you can see here by the red arrows, another uh, taxonomic disaster in terms of the uh, anemone fish situation. The Amphiprion chrysopterus from the Solomon Islands are nowhere near related to the other Amphiprion chrysopterus from Fiji and Morea. Um, so again, that's a, a group that probably needs to be revised taxonomically, but that likely represents um, three species instead of, instead of just one. And then um, the last one I just wanted to, to highlight here are the skunk clownfish. So these, you see these commonly photographed on reefs, um, Amphiprion uh, acolopsius and Amphiprion paradarian. Um, these are two separate groups. Um, as well. So we, we see different lineages in Bali and Madagascar um, for one of the species and Bali and Papua New Guinea for the other. And again, if you can see where these branches meet, um, these, are, these are lineages that have been diverged from each other for probably two to three million years. Um, and so again, highly divergent anemone fish lineages. So there might be others. Um, but in general, um, just for some basic research that's been done over the last handful of, full of years, there's probably upwards of 37 or more different clownfish species um, instead of the 30 species that um, are currently described. And I did also want to highlight that this paper tackled where in the world um, these clownfish originated. Um, so about 12 million years ago, based on their uh, phylogenetic reconstruction, um, the symbiosis with sea anemones began about 12 to 15 million years ago. And um, it appears as though um, it evolved in the coral triangle itself. And so the coral triangle, of course, is um, the center of marine biodiversity, has a very complicated history of sea level rise and fall, um, which creates opportunity for allopatric speciation, which is when two groups get split by a physical barrier. Um, and so it appears as though um, the coral triangle is really the center of origin for all of the clownfish. And I also wanted to point out that even though the symbiosis occurred or basically originated about 12 to 15 million years ago, 25 of the 30 described species evolved within just the last 5 million years. And so from an evolutionary perspective, this is a very young symbiosis. And um, it's a classic example of, of an adaptive radiation. Um, so basically what that means is um, as, new, as new ecological niche space opens up, um, it op, you know, offers opportunity for rapid evolutionary change and rapid speciation. So this is um, analogous, this is analogous to what happened after the dinosaurs went extinct um, and mammals radiated into those ecological niches that were um, uh, left by the, uh, the dinosaurs that had died off. So um, something similar, we, we evolve a symbiosis with sea anemones, um, and then it leads to rapid uh, speciation because there are plenty of sea anemones on the reef um, to um, provide new niche space for these, for these fish to evolve into. 
Okay, so that sort of does it for the fish themselves. Now I'm gonna be talking about the host sea anemones, which is a little bit more uh, in line with the kind of research that I'm doing. Um, there are currently only 10 described species of host sea anemones um, throughout the entire Indo-Pacific region. Um, and a lot of my research that started in the symbiosis was because um, uh, I sort of recognize that these are species that have only been described using their uh, morphological characteristics, their physical um, outward appearance and characteristics. And so they've never been sequenced genetically. And so that's um, where I sort of got my start working on this symbiosis. Um, I also realized very early on that there had never been a phylogenetic tree of sea anemones that included all 10 species of host, um, the clownfish hosting species. And so the first part of my previous postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History was I um, did a, a major phylogenetic reconstruction of the order Actinearia, which is sea anemones. Um, and this time included all representatives from all 10 species of uh, hosting sea anemones. And um, what we found, we published this um, in 2019, is that sea anemones um, have evolved symbiosis with clownfishes um, at least three times independently. So whereas clownfish all belong to a single group that all descended from one common, recent common ancestor 12 to 15 million years ago, the sea anemones belong to very different parts of the sea anemone uh, evolutionary tree. And so, we found one group up here in red. These are the bubble tip sea anemones, um, which evolved symbiosis independently with anemone fish. In the blue, we found most of the heteractus species, along with the species macrodactyla. And then in the orange, these are the carpet sea anemones. And uh, this, this group uh, needs to be revised taxonomically, and that's something that we have planned down the line. Um, but this involves the, stick, the, the species in the genus Stichodactyla. It also um, includes the genus Cryptodendron, which is the pizza or adhesive sea anemone. Um, this was supposed to be in a separate family, but we found it nested within a larger um, carpet sea anemone group. And then also the Ritteri anemone, uh, Heteractus magnifica, uh, is not a Heteractus species. It actually is also nested within uh, the larger carpet sea anemone group. And so there's a lot of taxonomic revision that needs to be done with the host sea anemones. Um, but what we found was very interesting is where those, as the clownfish evolved symbiosis only once, it appears that the um, host anemones have evolved symbiosis with the fish at least three, three separate times. Um, and that's just sort of like a macro scale look at the sea anemones. Um, the, uh, the other thing with sea anemones is we just really don't know how many species there are. We, uh, I mentioned earlier that they've only been described morphologically, um, but no one has ever really taken um, the time to sample across the range and conduct really intensive uh, DNA sequencing for each of these 10 species. And so that's what I started um, at the American Museum of Natural History. And so I wanna present some information to you today on the bubble tip anemone which is the most common anemone in the trade. And as you can see here from these images, uh, these are wildly phenotypically variable species. And uh, some have nice bubble tips and some are green with purple tips and some are speckled, some are uh, bright red, some are kind of bland brownish green. Um, and so you can run the gamut. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the different varieties of bubble tips, I think we've there are some called like the sunburst and the black widow, and there's lots of different names for for this species in the trade based on the coloration. Um, and so I was able to um, sample fairly comprehensively of the bubble tip across across its range. Um, so this is its current range map. Um, I've highlighted the Arabian Peninsula in red because the bubble tip anemones in the Arabian Peninsula here. Um, are only solitary individuals that reproduce sexually, whereas through the rest of the range, they will clone themselves, as you're probably really familiar with the bubble tips in the, in the trade, end up splitting quite often. Um, they host 13 different species of, of clownfish, and it's probably the most cl heavily collected anemone um, um, in the trade. So we were able to 
acquire samples from most of the range. Um, and uh, I'd like to point out too that my uh, connections with MACNA have really helped with the sample acquisition. So Live Aquaria and Kevin Cohen have provided a number of samples for me um, from their collecting facilities in Tonga and elsewhere. And also Laura Simmons and Cans Marine have also um, collected for me and sampled for me uh, from the Great Barrier Reef. And so uh, the sort of connection between uh, scientists kind of out getting your own permits and collecting and the uh, trade and the hobby providing uh, samples has been really beneficial to this work. Um, so again, pretty decent um, sampling acquisition. Um, I sequenced 85 individuals using a DNA sequencing technique where we can sample thousands of, thousands of DNA fragments simultaneously across all the individuals. And then we end up with lots of independent locations scattered throughout the genome, which we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, in order to better understand um, the evolutionary history of this group. And so the results that we got back um, are pretty clear. So this is a, just a genetic cluster plot, um, which just groups individuals based on uh, genetic similarities or genetic relatedness. And you can see pretty easily that the Red Sea and the United Arab Emirates form this nice little clear-cut gray plot. Um, the bubble tip anemones from the Maldives form their own uh, little purple plot. And uh, things get a little more complicated in the coral triangle. Um, Singapore looks like it has the same genetic group throughout Singapore, but it looks like that genetic group also bleeds into Japan a little bit. Um, and then we also see this unique blue group um, in Japan and the Philippines. And then this orange group also seems to bleed into the Great Barrier Reef. So there seems to be a little more mixing uh, going on in the Coral Triangle. And then Tonga seems to be a little bit isolated itself. So the real question is, uh, do these data represent different species? And so I have a couple lines of evidence that I would argue that yes, they do. Um, the first one is that we know that in the Arabian Peninsula, these are animals that are only sexually reproducing. So that's a nice sort of a priori hypothesis that these are probably different species to begin with. We see that genetically it backs that up. Um, and what's interesting, if you take a different look at these data and you look at a genetic cluster grouping, we call it K equals two. So if you only look at two clusters, it looks like the Red Sea and the UAE are more closely related to each other. Um, and everything else appears to be more closely related to each other than they are to the Red Sea. So the samples from the Maldives, which are geographically close to the Red Sea, are actually more closely related to samples from Singapore, Japan, Australia, and Tonga than they are to the Red Sea. Um, and so this sort of grouping um, tells us a couple different things. One is that it's a Tethian biogeographic origin, which means that this is a group that's very old. The Tethi Sea um, was an ancient seaway that closed as Africa moved north and slammed into uh, Europe and Asia um, and closed an open seaway between the Atlantic and the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Um, so that was about 20 to 25 million years ago. So this appears to be a, an, old, an old lineage of sea anemones. And then the other interesting thing that we see um, is that in Japan, uh, where it seems to be some mixing going on, um, and we have two separate groups, um, and you look at everything about the animals from their physical appearance to where they're located on the reef to where they're located and collected in Japan, we can't tell any difference except that they host different species of fish. So everything here in orange hosts Amphiprion frenatus and everything here in blue hosts Amphibrion clarkine. So this habitat segregation by the fish is another pretty clear line of evidence that these things might be queuing in on um, some actually some different species of anemones. This is another way to look at the same data. And, um, and so really, um, we could maybe make an argument that Intact Maya quadricolor based on the sampling and sequencing that we've done uh, to date is about three to five different species. Um, like I mentioned, uh, the Arabian Peninsula appears to be an old Tethian relic species, and that these fish can differentiate between the different symbionts, which I find is interesting. So the samples from the Maldives also hosted Amphiprion clarki, 
those are more closely related to the samples in Japan that also hosted amphibrion Clark I. So there appears to maybe be some, um, an evolution of host preference by the fish. Um, and everything that hosted amphibrion Frenatus also kind of formed their own uh, separate group. So what does this all really mean um, for the clownfish symbiosis? Uh, well, the big takeaway here from uh, my perspective is really the age of uh, these animals. And so this idea that this, the Entec Maya quadricolor species complex um, began in the Tethys Sea means that the diversification of these sea anemones predated the origin of the symbiosis with clownfish. And so while the clownfish are evolutionarily young, at 12 million years old, the sea anemones appear to be much older and, and likely um, uh, survived for millions of years uh, solitarily before the uh, symbiosis with clownfishes began. Okay, and so that is almost exactly what I just said. I forgot I had this little slide in here. <laughs> um, so to sort of uh, reiterate here, um, how many species are there and where do they originate? Well, within the clownfish, there's probably 35 to 37 species. So there's a handful of species that are undescribed there. The anemone hosts are very underdescribed, much more so than the clownfish themselves. Um, and that some of the um, important anemone hosts existed, uh, again, for millions of years before the onset of the symbiosis. Okay. So that is it for the number of species. I'm gonna check my time here. Okay, a couple minutes, I'm so okay. Um, and I wanna move on to the next question of how does the symbiosis actually work? So if we all watched Finding Nemo, we all watched uh, uh, Marlin, I think Marlin is the dad's name, uh, tell Nemo he had to rub into the anemone uh, so that he wouldn't lose the mucus coating and get stung by their host. And so if that is all you know about clownfish, that's not, incorrect actually so that is true that they need to continually be in contact with their host however um it is a little bit of a misnomer to say that clownfish are not immune to anemone nematocysts which are the stinging cells in the tentacles or the venom itself um but rather it's this mucus coating on the fish that is actually preventing the anemone from firing their nematocysts and injecting the fish with the venom. And so as the fish is swimming through the anemone, the tentacles are not firing their little harpoon stinging cells at the fish. They are simply just not firing at all. And so this mucus coating uh, prevents this anemone discharge. And so like I mentioned though, with uh, Finding Nemo, the fish can lose this mucus coating without regular contact with the host anemone. Um, it's also important to point out that the clownfish themselves are not just dealing with a way to figure, or at least figuring out a way to keep the anemone from firing um, their nematocysts. So anemones themselves have additional toxins um, that are very nasty and these are called uh, cytolysin toxins and so um, these are these are toxins that are found in anemone mucus these are just sort of released um, ambiently by the anemone into the surrounding water column and so these cytolysin toxins actually attack the mucus coating on the gills themselves and they form pores so these are called pore forming cytolysin toxins and what they do is they basically make holes um, in, the, in the mucus coating and in the gills themselves, and it, it keeps the fish from um, breathing, essentially. So it is essentially um, inhibiting gas exchange. Um, and so the fish themselves have, have figured out a way to keep the anemones from uh, firing their nematocysts, and they're dealing with this uh, constant onslaught of toxins that the anemones are just sort of releasing ambiently. Um, so when an anemone actually grabs a fish um, to eat, it is injecting it, it is stinging it with the nematocysts and injecting venom directly into the body. And then as it's pulling it in, these pore forming toxins are attacking uh, the gills. And so, so the clownfish are actually um, pretty incredible in that they've sort of solved this sort of one-two punch um, by the anemone and so they can live in their predator this way. So how does this actually work? So uh, this is this mysterious mucus coating. 
Um, how have the anemone fish figured this out? And the answer is we just don't know. And this is still an active area of research. Um, but there are a couple consensus hypotheses, um, at least minimally for the discharge of nematocysts. And so the, the sort of community of researchers um, have all sort of converged on a consensus hypothesis, which is that the mucus coating is chemical camouflage, um, or another way to put this would be molecular mimicry. So basically the anemone is recognizing the fish as self. And so it is not firing their nematocysts and stinging the fish. And so how does this actually happen? And so uh, last year, uh, the current research group that I belong to here in Switzerland, uh, they published, they sequenced and assembled 13 clown, different species of clownfish genomes um, and one species of damselfish that was not, um, that does not live with anemones. And um, they sequenced and annotated uh, 16,000 genes um, and they searched for genes that were under positive selection at, that date back to the origin of the symbiosis with, um, with sea anemones. And of those 16,000 genes, they only recovered about 16 genes that were unique to clownfish um, that were under positive selection. And two of those actually um, were annotated uh, to have some interesting functions uh, that might be related to anemone discharge of uh, venoms and toxins. Um, these are nitrogen acetylated uh, sugar genes. And essentially what happens um, when C anemones discharge their nematocysts, um, that discharge of nematocysts is triggered by the presence of these nitrogen acetylated sugars. And so two of these genes that are under positive selection um, may actually either mask or remove nitrogen acetylated sugars from clownfish skin or clownfish epidermis. And so while this paper didn't actually uh, find a causal link um, in terms of the, genote, the genetic basis of the mutualism with sea anemones or like what exactly keeps them immune um, or keeping the nematocysts from firing, these two candidate genes um, appear to be uh, at least have some promise in terms of maybe explaining um, some of this resistance of the anemone fish to the host anemones um, at the genomic level. So I think that was very a very interesting finding. And again, this is all very new. This just came out last year. So there's plenty of more research um, to be on in this, in this arena. Um, and the other one that I, I just recently came across, this is a, this came out this year in 2020, and this is a preprint. This paper has not uh, been peer reviewed yet, um, but I did find it to be pretty interesting and I wanted to share it with you. Um, and this goes back to this idea of chemical camouflage. And so this was a study by Audette Gilbert et al. And the title is Microbiomes of Clownfish and Their Symbiotic Host Anemones Converge Before Their First Physical Contact. And so, uh, the bacteria that live in the mucus um, lining of the fish and the bacteria that live in the mucus coating of the anemone are very important in terms of um, providing chemical signatures. And this is especially true in vertebrates. And so what the study did was it actually uh, characterized the bacterial communities in Amphiprion percula and Heteractus magnifica of uh, pairs of fish and anemones that were um, at, were placed into uh, separate tanks, but that shared the same water. So these fish were kept uh, isolated from their host, um, but they were kept in the same, um, they were added to the same water system, kind of like, you know, your main tank and your sump. And uh, they found that the microbiomes uh, converged be between the fish and the anemones as quickly as 15 minutes after um, the fish and the anemones were, were placed in the same water system. Um, and so that's really interesting. So if that's, if that's the case, we have um, sort of some evidence now for this kind of chemical camouflage um, maybe potentially being important in terms of um, the fish and the anemones um, living together. Um, so these two examples that I showed you, uh, both, both based on DNA sequencing, um, are really some of the first um, empirical data that provide real evidence for this sort of chemical camouflage 
hypothesis um, in terms of why the fish and the anemones um, can live together. So I thought that was kind of an interesting new um, piece of information to kind of share with the rest of the community. And um, so for the last um, little bit of the talk, and I think I'm again, doing okay on time, um, is, is there a hidden partner of the symbiosis? And so I just spent some time talking about the uh, bacterial communities that are on the fish and the anemone mucus. And so uh, two years ago, when I was in the, uh, the Maldives, I actually had an opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Chris Meyer, who is a curator at the Smithsonian, and he and I went to the Maldives together. And um, we were there to both sample our, uh, our study animals. Chris studies calories and I study anemones. So we just dive together and collect, um, collect samples for the species that we study from an evolutionary perspective. But he had mentioned um, that he had access to um, the ability to study some, to conduct some microbiome studies if I was interested in developing a project with him. Um, and so we had just um, swam across a really unique reef flat community um, in the Maldives where there were plenty of anemones, these uh, Heteractus magnifica anemones down here in the middle um, labeled non-host uh, that did not have any um, fish in them. So all the other anemones we came across on the reefs in the Maldives um, either hosted the endemic uh, Amphibrion nigrippes, um, or the Amphiprion clarki. So this, this one little pocket of, um, of anemones, which was only about a meter deep uh, reef flat, did not host fish. So we uh, decided to uh, develop a study uh, where we were going to look at the uh, bacterial diversity of anemones that hosted fish and anemones that, ho that did not host fish. Um, and also look at the, uh, the differences in the bacterial communities among the different, the five different species of sea anemones um, that we found in the Maldives. Um, and so we found them um, and sampled across five different anemone species in three different symbiotic states. Um, so you either hosted Amphibrion clarki, you didn't host a fish, or you hosted Amphibrion nigrippes, and uh, also in three different habitats. So we sampled on the outside of the atoll, sampled on the reef flat, and we also sampled on the inner patch, patch reef lagoons. And um, one of the things that we found, which was really interesting, is that the host identity was very important. But when you group the anemones um, based on the type of clownfish species that they hosted, that appeared to explain most of the diversity in the bacterial communities. So if you hosted uh, no fish, you seem to have a bacterial community that was very similar to each other. If you hosted Amphiprion clarki, regardless of what anemone species you were, you had a very similar bacterial profile. And if you hosted Amphiprion nigrippes, um, you also, again, had a, a bacterial community that was uh, maybe more closely or more similar to each other than to anything else. There's some overlap here, of course, because nothing is um, perfectly clear cut. Um, but it does show that hosting the same species of clownfish leads to a convergence in sort of the bacterial community um, among different species of anemones. And so that was really interesting. Um, but then we took this a step farther and we wanted to say, okay, now that we know what bacteria are here, we wanted to then predict what those bacteria actually do. So from a functional standpoint. So, um, once we uh, predicted the function of these different bacterial groups, one of the things that we found was that simply hosting clownfish at all leads to increased functional diversity um, in the host anemone microbiome. And so uh, if, if having more diversity is better, uh, which it typically is, um, then this could be a potentially uh, previously unknown mutualistic benefit uh, to hosting the clownfish. So, um, the fish is increasing um, the bacterial diversity on the host sea anemone itself. And so in addition to protecting each other, in addition to passing off nitrogenous waste, in addition to oxygenating the host at night, um, the clownfish themselves might also be conferring additional advantages to the anemones by increasing the bacterial community of their hosts. And so this paper was uh, just published earlier, earlier this year before everything shut down. Um, 
And so uh, to begin to wrap up here, um, I hope over the last 40 minutes or so, um, I've sort of conveyed a, a bit of a message, which is that although this symbiosis is intimately familiar to all of us um, from Finding Nemo through just uh, experience in the uh, aquarium hobby, um, it is still a very mysterious symbiosis. There is still a lot for us to learn. Um, and I didn't even scratch the surface talking about clownfish coloration or stripe patterns or hybridization or a number of different things that are uh, some very active ongoing areas of research with the symbiosis. Um, but we still don't even know the basics, how many species there are, um, still, remains, still remains a bit of a mystery. Um, and genomics uh, are, are greatly improving our understanding of this iconic symbiosis. So the, the work that I'm gonna be doing here in Switzerland is gonna be tackling the genomes of the sea anemone hosts themselves, um, which hopefully will uh, add some increased insight into the symbiosis um, from the host perspective, which is often historically ignored a little bit. Um, and, but even though these kind of next kind of fancy gen next generation sequencing technologies and genomics are uh, important, the field research uh, also remains very critical. So we still need to understand um, behavior. We need to understand range sizes of these animals and host preferences all play a really important role in providing a holistic understanding of this, of this symbiosis. Um, and so with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge a lot of different funding sources and collaborators and students, um, especially MACNA and Live Aquaria, Kansas Marine, and uh, NSF, uh, the American Museum of Natural History, of course, uh, the European Union, um, really uh, to work at this scale um, really takes a lot of collaborators as well. So <laughs> I can't simply just pop into any country I want and start working. So I really appreciate uh, all the collaborators, the dozens of collaborators that um, I've been able to build relationships with over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I probably won't be awake here at uh, three o'clock in the morning, but I'm happy to take your questions via email and Kevin can pass on uh, any questions anyone may have. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Yeah, like Ben, ben mentioned at the end of each day, we were having uh, question and answer sessions with the speakers for that day. However, uh, given Ben's uh, time zone and uh, need to work on this in, in his morning, we don't want to keep him up all night. So uh, you can head to macna.org slash questions. That's M-A-C-N-A dot org slash questions. And you can just uh, fill in a question for Ben, select Ben's name, and uh, we'll pass that on to him. Uh, we will ask you, just put your own name, your email address. That way, uh, Ben can uh, go ahead and respond to you. And we'll collect uh, all questions uh, throughout the weekend as well. So, Ben, thank you very much today for joining us at MACA 2020 Phoenix Rising. Thank you.